Um, as Marty mentioned, I, I'm a deal actor. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Psionic. Um, we're based out in, um, in Champaign, actually, so uh, local to here. And what we do is we build advanced bionic limbs that are affordable and accessible um, to everyone. And so for the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about kind of like um, the, the origins of Psionic and how we developed this as uh, I was a graduate student here at the University of Illinois and where we're at now. And then the second half is going to focus uh, a bit more on our uh, sensory feedback research and some of the crazier things that we've been working on that uh, in, in secret as well that we're going to um, reveal a little bit uh, uh, soon too. So um, when I when I give these talks, I first like to start off with a um, with a video, and this was a commercial that the University of Illinois ran uh, like maybe like five years ago, four or five years ago, um, that was played during uh, the halftime of football games. Where's the English building? Could you go over that again? Hey, can I check that? When's that paper due? Can I tell you my idea? How can we make it cheaper? Do you think this will work? How'd that feel? And so if you didn't notice, that was me at the end of that video. Uh, and what I like about this commercial in particular is it highlights the journey of being like a, a young kid who's just curious about the world all the way to, you know, getting a PhD and a doctorate and then doing these crazy things like a, a mind controlled bionic arm, right? And so for me personally, um, the journey started when I was actually seven years old. Uh, my parents are from Pakistan and I was visiting for one of the first times and that was the first time I met someone with a limb difference. And she was my age, um, living in poverty, missing her right leg and using a, a tree branch as a crutch. And that's um, what inspired me to want to go into this field. And so as uh, Marty had mentioned, I, I uh, came, I uh, graduated from Loyola. I worked at Loyola for a couple of years in their CS department teaching. And then I joined the MD PhD program here in 2010 at the University of Illinois. And uh, it was while I was an undergraduate student at Loyola that right across the street, they made some huge breakthroughs in mind controlled bionic limbs. And this is Amanda Kitts, and she had lost her left arm right above her elbow due to a motorcycle accident. And she is controlling this bionic arm just by thinking about the movements that she wants to make. So she's thinking about bending her elbow and making a pinch and grabbing all these different um, objects on the table. And then her muscles are, are um, her corresponding nerves and muscles are firing and they're using those signals to drive this bionic limb. Now, this was huge, right? Again, this was at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, downtown Chicago, across the street from Loyola. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to do is the perfect mix of, of um, clinical medicine, of uh, rehabilitation, of neuroscience, of engineering. And there was one big problem though. And that problem is that the arm that you guys just saw in that video costs about $100,000 to make. And there's over 10 million people with hand amputations worldwide. 80% of them are in developing nations and less than 3% have access to affordable uh, rehabilitative care. And so what you see on this guy's right hand um, is what's known as a hook prosthesis. Um, and basically it's just two steel pincers connected with a bicycle cable to your shoulders. And then when you squeeze your shoulders together, this, uh, the hook will open. And when you relax your shoulders, this hook will close. And so this technology hasn't changed since like the Civil War era of the United States, right? It, it looks like a hook, right? You have to use your shoulders to control it. So it's, it's really outdated. It, it doesn't have um, as much functionality that you would with like, uh, a, like you know, a five fingered hand, um, for example. And so the next step up is uh, what is on this man's left hand. And this is what we call a myoelectric prosthesis. Myo meaning muscle and electric meaning, well, electric, right? So, uh, the way that that hand works is that he has two muscle sensors placed on his forearm, uh, one that can, uh, over his wrist flexors and the other over his wrist extensors. And when he tries to open and close the hand, that hand will open and close. So that's a, a bit more intuitive because it's using your uh, own inherent muscle signals to control um, that uh, similar movement. But 
that hand is super heavy, it's super expensive. And as you get into even more sophisticated hands where individual fingers can move, they get really fragile. And so these are like, you know, $50,000 hands that are just breaking because people accidentally like hit them against the side of a table um, and they just snap at those joints. On top of that, if you were to get fitted with one of these hands, so if you lost your hand and you got one of these, you wouldn't be able to actually feel anything from it and because there's no sensory feedback. And so over the last six years, um, we've been developing prosthetic limbs that solve these problems in particular, right? And so we've developed a hand that's robust, fast, lightweight, has sensory feedback, and is actually covered by Medicare. And we're going to talk about that journey of how we got there. And so what you see in this picture is actually the very first prosthetic hand that we had ever developed um, in the lab. And over the last um, six years, we've actually gone through nine different prototypes, and I'm showing five of them um, here. And um, for many of you who have, uh, who have known me and seen me in this journey, you may even be familiar with many of the, the uh, prosthetic hands that you see in this picture. And the, the ones on the, the, the top left, right? So the very first one that was based off a uh, humanoid robot that you could 3D print for uh, about uh, $1,000. And we modified it so it was just the arm. But there are problems with it. It's super fragile. And the electronics were located in the forearm. And if you still have your forearm, you can't actually physically place um, you know, sensors and electronics there. So we had to figure out ways to move all those electronics in the hand, keep the hand um, super functional, but also um, still, uh, still uh, articulating every digit and um, looking uh, anthropomorphic as well, looking human-like um, as well. And so we, we kept doing that over these iterations. And so we're gonna first focus on these, uh, these top two hands that you see here. And it was in the summer, or sorry, the spring of 2014, um, when I was in the uh, I was in the uh, lab of Professor Tim Brettel here at the University of Illinois, and we got a visit. Um, the university got a visit from this guy. Um, so this is David Krupa. He is the he's an alum from the University of Illinois. He's the CEO and founder of a nonprofit organization called the Range of Motion Project. And the Range of Motion Project, their mission is to provide. Um, uh, prosthetics to those who can't afford them around the world. They're based out of the US, Guatemala, and Ecuador. And um, uh, because 80% uh, of amputees are in developing nations and less than 3% have access to rehabilitative care. So they want to uh, change that, right? And so he was coming back to the university because he was winning an award from the International Studies Program for starting this organization. And uh, so I was like, I need to talk to this guy. This is like what we've wanted to do. Like, this is what I've wanted to do my whole life, right? So I, I go and visit him and, I'm, uh, and um, uh, I tell him after his talk, like, hey, you know, we've been 3D printing hands um, in the lab. Is that something you might be interested in? He was just like, yeah, maybe. And so showed him the lab the next day. And then I didn't hear back from him again. And I was, it was pretty sad. Um, but two weeks later, out of nowhere, I get this email from him that literally said, dude, I felt this vibe between us when we met and we've got to figure out a way to work together. And that's when Dave's and my bromance began. And then two weeks after that, he, um, I was, uh, he sent me another email saying that he was able to secure funding from the US Embassy in Quito, Ecuador to have me and uh, another graduate student working in Professor Bredel's lab to go down to Ecuador and try out our hand on a patient. And so keep in mind, A, we had just built a, this prosthetic hand for like the first time. We barely got it to even work like on us. And now we had to like come up with a version of the hand where the electronics would fit inside the hand and then we would fit it on a patient in Ecuador of all places, right? So that summer was absolutely nuts. So let's fast forward to the end of that summer, right? The, the day before we fly down to Ecuador, we don't have anything working, but we figure we're gonna be down in Ecuador for two weeks so um, we'll, we've got all the pieces we need to fix this hand. We'll, we'll go down there and we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll, everything will be fine because we can just uh, figure it out when we get down there. We fly down to Ecuador, Dave picks us up from the airport. And the first thing he tells us is that um, tomorrow we've got a meeting with the US Embassy and they wanna see everything working. And we were just like, oh man. And so, um, we, we, we go to the, um, the hotel room and we get started, like, um, we'll get started on working right away. And it was basically the beginning of like, basically two weeks of all all nighters trying to get this hand to work. And so this next video, um, 
shows, um, sorry, um, the, uh, so we went to the U.S. Embassy in Quito and uh, we got the hand to a point where like if I flexed really, really, really hard, I could like barely get this hand to close. And if I extended my wrist really, really, really hard, I could barely get this hand to open. And uh, it, uh, we figured that, you know, we have to show the U.S. Embassy something, right? And we show them this demo of like me trying to like grab a bottle and they are just like completely stunned because they've never seen a robot in their lives before. So they don't know how it's supposed to work that I'm supposed to like easily make a pinch and a three finger grasp and a key grasp and like do all these different motions with the hand instead of struggling really hard to just barely get this hand to open and close. And so they um, start asking us questions like, okay, so um, when you do this on a patient next week, we're thinking that like, we're going to have two newspapers come and three news crews cover the event. And we were just like, oh man, okay. So the bar is now set really high. And then they started asking us questions like, where are you guys from? And they said, oh, we're from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And they said, you're from the University of Illinois. In that case, we're going to bump you up to all the international media stations. Because it turned out that at the time, the president of Ecuador was also an alum from the University of Illinois. And any chance that he got to promote the university, he took. So now the bar was set super high to get this hand working on a patient that we've never done before, right? And so the following day, we met our patient. And this is Juan Sequillo. He lost his left hand due to a machine gun fire from a helicopter uh, 40 years ago. And he was in the Ecuadorian army. It was a border war between Ecuador and Peru. And... Um, he this uh, this picture was showing us trying to um, get him to control the hand for the first time and it, it was not working and to make matters worse he actually wasn't going to um, he had to fly out to Brazil and he wasn't going to be back until um, the day that the media was coming the following week meaning that we only got one chance now to get this right in front of like international news stations. So again, super high bar, lots of all-nighters trying to figure out what could be wrong with this giant mess of a breadboard and all, all these like the, the code that's, uh, that's powering this whole thing. Okay, so fast forward to the following week, the, the day that the, the following Thursday morning, the day that the media is getting there. The night before, Dave Krupa tells us that He's picking us up at 6 a.m. The media is coming at 9 a.m. And whatever we have at that point, we've we've just got to roll with it. So 6 a.m. rolls around. Uh, Mary Nguyen, the, uh, the uh, other graduate student in the Professor Brettel's lab, who you see in this picture, she and I had been up for about 32 hours straight trying to figure out why this hand wasn't working. So 6 a.m. rolls around. I'm looking through hundreds of lines of code. She's looking at this giant mess of a breadboard trying to figure out what's wrong. And then at 6.08, I see this one line of code that looks a little bit weird. And I send a text message to Dave saying, hey, Dave, I think I might have found something. I just need a couple more minutes. And he just responds saying, OK. And it turns out there was one line of code where two variables were switched on the opposite side of an equal sign. And as soon as I switched those two variables, everything started working. When I made a pinch, the hand made a pinch. When I made a tripod grasp, the hand made a tripod grasp. And had Dave come to actually pick us up on time, uh, we wouldn't have had the chance to figure it out. So we're actually really lucky that he was late uh, to come get us. So it's one thing though for it to work on me. It's another thing for us to like hook up all the sensors to Juan and make sure that everything is working on his limb in particular and his residual limb. And so we figure that media is coming at 9 a.m. He's going to be there um, at 8 a.m. So we'll hook everything up, make sure everything works. So that way, when the media gets there, it is going to be like really straightforward, easy. Take the videos. Boom, we're done. 9 a.m. rolls around. All the media is there and Juan's not there yet. He actually doesn't get in until 10 a.m. So now all the media is getting super annoyed and like having to wait. And again, now we've only got one chance to get this right in front of all the cameras that are rolling, right? So immediately, as soon as Juan gets in, we hook him up to all the muscle sensors. And the first thing we do is to check and see if um, the muscle sensors are reading properly. And we did this and every single channel was dead. And we were like, wait, 
how, how is that possible? It was just working on me, right? And so Mary and I, we go into debug mode. We're looking at this giant mess of a breadboard trying to figure out what's wrong while Juan and Dave are, uh, you know, stalling with the media, you know, telling the backstory of the range of motion project and how Juan lost his hand just to buy us enough time to figure out what was wrong with this giant mess of a breadboard. And so we checked the voltage on the breadboard and we saw that the numbers were, uh, were off uh, from what they were supposed to be. And usually what that means is that there's a problem with your power supply. And so we were powering this giant mess with two nine volt batteries. And we had noticed that one of the batteries had puffed up to about double in size and was burning hot to the touch. And had we not noticed it at that point, we might've been on the news for a different reason. And so fortunately I had a fresh uh, nine volt in my pocket. I took it out, I, I swapped it in for the, the bad one and hooked everything up properly and everything started working. And so all the muscle signals appeared and it was like, whew, crisis averted, right? But it's one thing for us to read as muscle signals. It's another thing for the, the, the actuators in the hand, the robotics to uh, respond accordingly and the machine learning algorithm to work to detect his muscle signals uh, and make the robot move as well. And so the way this hand works is that um, when you turn it on, um, you go through a training phase, like a two minute training period where the hand is going to make different movements. So um, he'll, uh, the hand will make a pinch and he's supposed to hold a pinch for 15 seconds. It'll make a fist. He holds a fist for 15 seconds, um, hand open for 15 seconds, relax for 15 seconds. And then after those um, two minutes of collecting that muscle sensor data, it'll build a predictive model saying that, oh, um, based on this sensor data, the probability is like 95% that you're trying to make a pinch. So we're going to make the hand do the same thing. And uh, so after those two minutes of training um, that, that Juan went, to, uh, went through, the hand opened up and I asked him to close it and nothing happened. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, what else could go wrong at this point? And so this was completely serendipitous as well, right? Juan happens to be the leader of all the Muslims in Ecuador. And I happen to be Muslim myself and there are not that many Muslims in Ecuador. There's probably like less than a hundred. And so the fact that I happened to be working with the, the leader of all the Muslims there was completely serendipitous. And we didn't know this until we had met. Um, and so he turns to me and he looks at me and he says, Bismillah, say Bismillah. And so for those of you who don't know, Bismillah is just invoking the name of God. It's something that Muslims say before they start any task. And I'm just like, Bismillah, okay, Bismillah. So I hit the reset button on the hand and the training procedure starts all over again. He holds a pinch for 15 seconds, holds a tripod grasp for 15 seconds, a fist, hand open, relax. The hand opens up again and they ask him to move it. And this time the hand closes and the media comes rushing around the table, like, you know, asking him how it feels for it to be moving his hand for the first time in 35 years. And I take a step back, a huge sigh of relief. And I'm thinking in my head, you're a man of God. And so this next video shows um, the, one of the international media stations um, that was covering the event um, uh, of the day that we had Juan controlling the hand. Quiteño es el primer beneficiado de una prótesis de mano con ayuda en su financiamiento. El programa es realizado por jóvenes de la Universidad de Illinois en Estados Unidos. Juan Suquillo es ex comandante de guerra. Fue así como perdió parte de su brazo. De esto han pasado más de 30 años. Varios miembros de mi pelotón eh, sufrieron heridas y en la particularmente la mía me cobró el brazo izquierdo. Gracias al avance de la tecnología, hoy puede acceder a una prótesis. Parte de mi ha vuelto. Ha vuelto. Jóvenes ingeniosos y con un gran empeño por ayudar al prójimo más necesitado han desarrollado una prótesis de brazo bioeléctrico con la posibilidad de retroalimentación sensorial, es decir, sentir como una mano de verdad. Ok, so, two things I want to point out um, in this video, right? One is that if you look at this hand, it's like three times the size of a normal human hand. It's got wires plugged into everything, plugged into like two MacBooks, plugged into my laptop, plugged into a power supply, plugged into the breadboard, plugged into the wall, right? Despite that, Juan said that he felt as though a part of him had come back. And that was because he hadn't made a pinch with his left hand in 35 years. In fact, 
he had forgotten how to make a pinch with his left hand. And we actually had to retrain his brain in order to remember how to do it by placing a mirror um, that blocked his view of his amputated limb and reflected his right hand. And then asking him to make a pinch with both hands at the same time to trick his brain into thinking that his left hand was actually there. And so for him then to be able to actually control that uh, the prosthetic hand to make a pinch the same way that he was, he it was it wasn't just moving for him but it was moving for us and that's when we realized that you know if we stay in academia uh, then this just becomes like another journal paper the only way we could make everyone feel the exact same way that juan did was to commercialize the technology and that's when psionic was born so we came back to the to the states we came back to the university uh we entered the school's uh, uh business plan competition the COZAD new venture competition in 2015. Uh, we ended up winning that i won the illinois innovation prize in 2016 and then we've won several grants um, from the national science foundation um, to develop the the actual commercial version of this uh, prosthetic hand which is now known as the ability hand and so this video showed kind of where we were and so this is what the hand looks like now and so this is retired US Army Sergeant Garrett Anderson doing push-ups for one of the first times since his army days and holding a 50 pound kettlebell and various of our, and our various patients are able to do uh, activities of daily living um, like close their laptop lid. Um, one of our patients up in Chicago, she had recently become a grandmother and she was able to feed her granddaughter for the first time uh, by holding the bottle with her ability hand. Um, and we can also um, candy paint tint, it's actual carbon fiber that's on there and so we can candy paint tint it like a car. And so hers we made like a, a reddish pink color that just glistens in the sunlight and reflects uh, a lot of her personality as well. And so um, we were really excited to be able to, uh, to do that. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, right now so you guys can actually uh, see me. And uh, and Angie, are you, are you able to see, or is everyone able to see me okay um, too? Uh, all right, so I've got the ability hand here with me here and it's waving to you guys. Hi. Uh, and typically the way you control it is through these uh, muscle sensors that are, are located um, on the bottom here. And uh, the thing though is that I, I'm not connected to those muscle sensors right now, but there's Bluetooth on here and we've got an app for it. There's an app for everything these days, right? So on iOS and Android, so I'm on my Android phone and uh, all five fingers flex and extend and the thumb rotates as well. Um, this is actually the fastest bionic hand on the market. Uh, the close time of the fingers is 200 milliseconds. So it's actually faster than the blink of an eye, um, which closes in about 300 milliseconds. Um, you can do various graphs. So all, all five fingers flex and extend and thumb rotates as well. So here's, um, for example, a key grasp. Um, you can give someone like a thumbs up. Um, you can do things like a, a pinch, for example. Here's like a, a, the tripod grasp that I was mentioning. If you're at a rock concert, you know, you can uh, rock on. Um, you can do uh, pointing. So here's pointing with a, an index finger. You can point with other fingers too. Uh, it's a question we get asked all the time. Uh, and it is one of the most requested features. Yes, you can point with your middle finger um, as well. So um, this is, like I mentioned, this is actual carbon fiber on here. So it's super light and super strong. Um, it's uh, lighter than an average adult human hand. Um, this is 470 grams. Average adult human hand is about 500 grams. Um, the fingers themselves are made out of uh, flexible silicone and rubber. So it can actually take a beating so I can like smash these fingers. They survive the impact. Um, you saw Sergeant Anderson doing push-ups on them. Uh, we broke a board martial arts style um, with it. We, uh, most recently we had put it in a dryer for 10 minutes and it just tumbled around and it totally survived. Um, the, the dryer didn't fare so well, um, but the, the hand was, was all right. Um, it's water resistant up to the wrist, so if it gets dirty, we literally just take it to the sink and rinse it off. Um, and it's USB-C rechargeable, so the same way you plug in your phone, you can plug in your arm. It'll recharge within an hour if it's completely dead. And you can actually charge your phone from your arm too, so it's another superhuman ability that we like to give our users. Um, and then one of the coolest things is that this is the first hand on the market to give users sensory feedback. And we'll get into that in a, in a little bit as well. But we have pressure sensors that we place in the fingertips that um, uh, connect to a vibration motor in the socket. So when Sergeant Anderson holds his daughter's hand, he's actually able to feel it. And that's something, like I said, no other prosthetic hand uh, on the market can do. And so I'll um, share my screen again so you guys can um, uh, see kind of like an overview of uh, basically what I was mentioning. 
And um, so this is a, this is kind of like an overview of the ability hand, and uh, it's a FDA registered device. So it's um, it, it is an actual medical device that is reimbursable. Uh, by insurance, and we've actually been able to hit a price point that Medicare will cover. So not only is it one of the most advanced bionic hands on the market, but we've expanded access to um, the bionic hands like ours from 10% of the upper limb difference population that could afford it, which was only like workers compensation and VA insurances to 75% of the upper limb difference community uh, because we are, were able to get it covered under Medicare. And that was really important for us. We wanted to make the hand both advanced and accessible because we believe that everyone deserves great design. Um, and so just to give you an idea of uh, the, the speed of this hand that I was mentioning, um, this next video shows one of our patients up in Chicago. And this was about three minutes after he um, was fitted with the prosthetic hand, with the, an ability hand for the first time. This is his first like prosthetic um, that he had ever received. And he was able to catch a water bottle that was thrown to him because of his um, response time. Are you ready? Just sit right here. Oh! And again, it's because of how quickly those uh, those fingers move and how good his control is um, over that device that he was able to um, to do that. And to give you guys another uh, example of how robust these fingers are, this next video shows um, a, a, um, a an impact test that we did um, on the fingers. And on the right side is like a traditionally designed um, finger with a with a standard um, pin joint. Um, at the at the uh, at one of the knuckles, and then on the left side is our compliant finger design that we developed uh, to be impact resistant, and you'll see what the results are. You can see the one on the right; it just fell off and broke entirely. And when the piston raises up on the left, the finger just comes back to its original position, as though nothing had happened at all. And that was so important because the number one problem that we found that patients had was that their $50,000 bionic hand was breaking, like I said, because they accidentally like hit it against a door or the side of a table. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that our hand was um, uh, resistant to those kinds of impacts. Uh, okay, so um, in um, so we went back to Ecuador in 2016, this time, um, with a slightly newer version of the hand than the one that you saw in that original uh, video. And this next video shows the first time that we hooked um, the hand up to a socket and he was able to control it. And you can tell we were pretty excited that that had worked. Uh, and so then we went back again in 2017 and this time we took the hand outside of the lab and uh, started having him do some activities of daily living like the inevitability of it we can just feel it in our bones you know every day we get up and there's just another development and it's because it is right now like this is the nexus of change where prosthetics of tomorrow are going to change thousands and thousands of people's lives. Finally. And so we went back again in 2018 with the version eight of our ability hand. And as soon as we get down there, of course, the first thing that he wants to do is drive his car. And we're just like, are you serious, right? And so we, we get in his car and like we, 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 we start driving and it's like in downtown Quito with like a ton of traffic, right? And to, to put this in perspective, his car is manual, it's manual transmission. So his right intact hand has to stay on the stick while his bionic hand is on the wheel and there's no power steering in this car either. So he has to have a super firm grip on this thing. And so uh, my heart was racing the entire time we were filming this and he was just like, this isn't any big deal at all. And so this next video shows uh, us filming that. Being used for 
uh, holding the wheels. And yeah. He didn't even change the blinkers. <laughs> and he gets back into traffic like it's no big deal um, at all. <laughs> and so, um, and so what we haven't really touched on yet is like the touch feedback, right? Uh, that, that we put in the hand. And so as I was mentioning, this is the first hand on the market to give users um, sensory feedback. And the way we currently do it is through um, these tiny barometric pressure sensors that are in all of your cell phones, all of your GPS devices. They're like one or two bucks uh, a piece. And typically they measure air pressure. And so what we do instead is we inject silicone into them and then they can detect super light touches that are depressing on the silicone all the way to very strong pinches that are applied um, uh, above the sensor itself. And then um, some of the research that we've been doing is uh, relaying that information to the user um, through uh, electrotactile stimulation on your skin. So, instead, uh, uh, so by sending a small amount of current um, across your skin and by changing the amount of current that we send and the timing of it, we can make it feel like different things, light touch, strong touch, pressure, vibration, pain. The difficult part is trying to make that sensation consistent um, and so that's still an area of research that we're working on is like, how do we always make it feel like a pressure? How do we always make it feel like the, the right intensity um, given how much you uh, push on the pressure sensor? Um, so this next video that I'm gonna show is the first time ever that we had hooked up um, Juan to the sensory feedback system uh, when we went down there in 2016. No, you still don't feel anything on the back of the mouth, but how about when I push the front tank? And so I'm going to tap on it rapidly. Do you feel all the different taps I'm making right now? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to do this. Can you can you close your eyes for me? And I want you to tell me when I'm actually touching the, the finger. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now what I want you to try and tell me is whether it's a light touch or a strong touch. Light. Strong. Strong. Light. Strong. And so he was even able to tell or distinguish between the light and the strong touches um, that I was making. And I just want to also point out that that was a, a cameo from my uh, from my wife Whitney in the background, along with our at the time three month old son um, who came with us to uh, Ecuador to make this uh, whole thing happen with um, with Juan. So. Um, kudos uh, to, to them too. I, I wouldn't be able to do any of this without uh, their support um, at all. And so what does this type of feedback enable you to do, right? So what it allows you to do is really fine manipulation of delicate objects. And so this next video shows one of our patients up in Chicago. He's an 85 year old triple amputee and he's grasping a hollow eggshell without cracking it while blindfolded on his first try um, because of the pressure sensors that are uh, that are in the hand. And um, we uh, did, a, did a study on this that we uh, published at the, uh, the My Electric Control Symposium last year. And we showed that um, by giving this um, type of pressure sensing, this touch feedback to users, we're able to dramatically A, decrease the number of eggshells that were crushed. And also when grasping a very flimsy cup, um, you could grasp it without crushing it. Um, and that's what um, these results are showing here. And um, so the next half of this talk is going to kind of um, talk about some of like the, the newer developments we've made in both like sensory feedback technology and um, especially with respect to like proprioception and, and some of the, uh, the more uh, like, I guess, out there even uh, projects that um, we're, we're focusing on. And so one of the things I was working on my uh, on my thesis too, and, the, and one of the things I had mentioned that's really difficult to do with electrotactile stimulation is to make sure that it feels like a consistent stimulation over long periods of time. And one of the things that affects that all the time is 
the what we call the the resistance between your skin and the electrodes. So if you sweat a lot, then that resistance between the electrodes and your skin changes. Um, if you if the electrodes start to peel off, that changes that resistance too. And what ends up happening is that um, if the electrode starts to peel off, for example, um, the sensation might feel like a shock and you never want your patient to ever feel like a, a, a tiny shock from uh, the, the electrodes, right? Um, so um, what we did is we started to monitor that resistance between um, the skin and the electrodes. And then we would change the amount of current that we would send in the timing of it, depending on that resistance. And by doing that, even if you peel the electrodes off, then we, uh, it would feel like a consistent sensation throughout the entire thing. And even if you started exercising and sweating a ton, it would still feel like uh, a consistent sensation. So we had um, uh, Sergeant Anderson um, right outside of uh, Beckman and CSL, like in 90 degree weather, you know, get on this elliptical and like sweat like crazy. And you can see his resistance was dropping on the, on the top plot um, when he was doing this um, sweating over this, uh, a duration of like 30 seconds. Um, and, uh, the sensation ended up diminishing because of this change in resistance and we didn't adjust the amount of uh, current that we sent or the timing of it at all. But then when we turned our controller on and we saw that the resistance was still changing and dropping, but we changed the amount of current and the timing of it uh, accordingly, we were able to make it feel like a consistent sensation throughout the entire, um, the entire time. And the same thing was true for when he was like peeling the electrodes. So when he didn't have the uh, electrodes on, um, you could see that there was like, a, it feels like static electricity pretty much. And um, uh, and on the last one where he peeled it off almost all the way, his muscle twitched a little bit from um, the, uh, the amount of current going through. But then when we turned the controller on again and we were controlling for those, um, the, the resistance, um, we could actually um, uh, make it feel like a consistent sensation um, the entire time. So some of the other technology that we've been working on has been in uh, conjunction with um, uh, Professor John Rogers, who uh, used to be at the University of Illinois, but is now at uh, Northwestern University. And uh, what we've been developing with him uh, was these uh, flexible electronic devices that could go on your skin, uh, almost like uh, electronic tattoos. And this one in particular that we had built was a combined muscle sensor along with stimulation electrodes that you could just put on a single patch and then um, with a hand like ours, you could control it and then feel from it um, with the same device um, uh, put on uh, your skin. And then over the last couple of years, we've scaled that to much larger electrodes. So um, here's one that you can wrap around your forearm entirely and then we can detect all the different graphs you're making like elbow flexion, elbow extension, wrist, uh, wrist rotation, wrist flexion, wrist extension, hand open, hand close, um, et cetera. And then most recently, um, we were also developing a wirelessly powered um, vibration motor system that you could just throw on as a patch. Um, and then it would feed back the uh, pressure signals from the fingers and then you would be able to feel it on your, um, on your residual, uh, on the patient's residual limb. So here's Sergeant Anderson again, um, uh, feeling uh, the handshake that I'm giving him from the uh, wireless epidermal patch that has this array of vibration motors um, or embedded inside of it. Um, so, um, okay. If you guys recall, um, the, uh, I guess the, um, the sensors that there are the, all these, uh, all this research that we've been doing, what it doesn't specifically address is the sensation of what we call proprioception. So, um, while you might be able to touch and feel something from it, if you close your eyes and you move your fingers around, you know exactly where your fingers are located without having to look at it. You know exactly how fast they're moving. And that joint sense is known as proprioception. And from these, with these electric prostheses, that is one of the major things that is missing um, from that. And so if you recall, this was the, the picture that I showed with all the different prototypes of the prostheses that we, we made. And on the very first one the, on the top left that we made, we actually um, made a very rudimentary but highly effective proprioception system on it that um, basically uh, what we did is we modified the, um, the motors that were uh, that were pulling these uh, fishing line tendons that went into the hand. And then we had another line of uh, a fishing line that went to your skin. And then we would adhere it to your skin with these like quarter size 3D printed contact pads. And it was coupled directly to the motor. So when the finger would move, it would also tug proportionally on your skin. And this next video shows that. And so you can see when this hand is making a fist, 
all three of those contact pads on, uh, on the uh, subject's forearm are stretching the skin accordingly to the position of the fingers. And it'll, uh, it'll replay again so you guys can see that. And what that allows the user to know is exactly where the location of the fingers are and how fast it's moving uh, based on how fast the skin is actually stretching. And that's similar to like, you know, the skin over your knuckles, for example, or the skin over um, like your, your wrist. It stretches when you flex those particular joints. And so when we did a, a study on this, we had like six subjects. We trained them for only six minutes only where they were presented with the like five different grasps that the hand was doing. And then we blindfolded them. We, uh, we put them, uh, we had uh, them wear earmuffs so they couldn't hear the hand at all. And they had to then determine what grasp the hand was making just based on the skin stretch feedback alone. And again, only after six minutes of training, they had 88% accuracy in determining like which grip the hand was making while blindfolded and not being able to hear it. So you can imagine that if they did this for like, you know, months, how good they'd be at discriminating each one of the individual finger movements that was corresponding to the skin stretch on their hand. Now, there's a more practical problem that's, that's involved with that uh, particular method of giving proprioception. And that is like donning and doffing like a, a, a quarter size three print pad that's adhered to your skin. Typically patients will take off the prosthesis at night and it would be, um, it, it would be almost prohibitive to have them have to like, you know, take off these contact pads that have adhesive on them and the next morning put the adhesive back on and then like put them in the right place and then like um, wear the hand. Um, so uh, that's something that, that um, we've always been looking into and seeing like how, how we can improve that. But this proprioception problem still persists, especially with these advanced bionic hands. And um, it was like, it was uh, around a year ago that I got the, uh, the chance to um, shadow uh, one of the local hand surgeons at, at Carl, Dr. Cliff Johnson, and um, he uh, was doing a, a particular operation. It was, it's called a trapeziectomy, um, where he had a 90-year-old uh, patient, and she had uh, her thumb was uh, basically in pain. It was impinging on her carpal bone whenever she tried to move it. And so the trapeziectomy, uh, what that did was that it took out that, it, it, uh, it removed that tra uh, trapezium carpal bone um, from the patient. So if you remove that bone though, what ends up happening is your thumb ends up sinking into the hand because there's nothing, no structure there to hold it up anymore. And so one of the things that uh, Dr. Johnson did was he had this, um, this material which he described to me as uh, medical grade yachting wire. And he, he took it and um, he, uh, basically um, ran it from the, the palm of the hand to the dorsal side of the hand and suspended the thumb in place. And so it got its full range of motion. And this would be uh, in her for like, you know, the, the next 10 years or the rest of her life. And when I saw this medical grade yachting wire, I was like, this reminds me exactly of the fishing line that we used as tendons that you guys just saw in this um, in this video of that original prosthetic hand that we had built. So during his lunch break, we uh, we looked it up and the fancy term for it is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, but it is the exact same thing as spectra fishing line, but just sterile. And so that got me thinking, right? And I was like, you know, in the last five to like 15 years, especially in, in Sweden and Australia, there's been a huge push in prosthetics for something called osseo integration. So um, instead of uh, wearing these devices that go like a, a suction socket over your residual limb, and there's no uh, internal interface to connect to your bones and muscles, um, what they do with osseointegration is they drill a hole into your residual limb, and then you have like a titanium abutment that sticks outside of your skin um, that you connect the prosthesis to, and it's directly attached to your bones. And the, the outcomes that they've seen with this over the last 15 years have been phenomenal, especially for lower limb amputees. Like um, there's actually a, a woman who's local to um, the Champaign-Urbana area um, who got this um, uh, osseointegration surgery in Australia. And um, she's able to feel what surface that she's working on or that she's walking on um, based on the vibration that she feels through her bones because the prosthesis is directly anchored to her bone. And again, this is an interface that's sticking outside of her skin that's directly attached to her bone. And so what got me thinking on that was that if they can do that, then can we take these, these like 
art of uh, um, this like medical grade yachting wire and use it like as an artificial tendon that we can connect to the residual tendons and then have that extend to the hand itself. And this is kind of a mock-up of what that idea looks like, right? So you have an osseointegrated implant that connects to your um, your metacarpal um, the bone, right? And or or your your proximal uh, phalanx, and then we take the residual tendons and then we would connect to them and connect those to the joints in the artificial um, prosthesis. And what this would allow for, if this uh, if we can get this to work, is a battery-free prosthesis that is driven by your own muscles, basically the same way prior to your amputation, and it gives you inherent proprioception. You will know exactly where the finger is located, how fast it's moving, how, uh, how much torque you're applying on it, because you're using your own inherent muscles and they have and your own sensors inside those muscles that tell you um, that information. And so we started um, doing some uh, biomechanical tests on um, a cadaver, so a human cadaver and a dog cadaver um, as well. And so um, this is a model of the, uh, of the prosthetic finger that we made. And we have specific channels that we put in this um, prosthetic finger. And the way that we designed this was to be similar to um, the, like, um, the actual anatomy and physiology of a human finger. And so we run these tendons, these, this like fishing line through um, the, uh, the prosthetic finger through those channels corresponding to each one of those actual tendons that's, um, uh, that's uh, uh, remaining in the amputee. And um, we did the same thing um, in the dog as well. And so I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen for a second because I have the real world examples of these right in front of me. Um, over here. And so here's the here's the finger, for example, and these are the tendons that we have down here. And then when you pull on these tendons, you can see the finger bends, or um, it can also um, extend as well. So these are the extensor tendons, and then in the front, you've got your flexor tendons over here. And then we've got the same thing for the hock of, of a dog right here. So um, the we've got this flexible filament that we printed that we put on the outside that acts as kind of like ligaments. And then we've got this rigid nylon bone um, system inside that works very similarly to the um, to the bone of uh, the canine. And so this screw is what we attach to the tibia of the canine. And then we will attach and then we attach these to we suture these onto the residual tendons. And then when you uh, when you pull on them, it'll cause the um, the hock or the ankle of the um, of the canine to bend. And uh, I'll start sharing my screen again so you guys can um, see that this is what it looks like when it's attached to the dog. So this is the prosthesis actually attached to the tibia of the dog and then the, um, the fishing line actually sutured to um, the, uh, the muscles. And what we, uh, we were able to tune the parameters of our prosthesis to basically match the output torque, like the paw strength of the, of the dog and also the range of motion. So like the joint angle um, of, the, of the hawk um, with, uh, like before we, um, before we amputated and then after we put the prosthesis on. So the, the red line um, is showing um, prior to the, the amputation of the, of the dog, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, leg on the cadaver. And um, the red line or the, the black line is when we put the prosthesis on and we're showing that the, uh, the paw strength and the range of motion um, is actually really close to what it was prior to um, removing um, the actual limb. So there's a couple open questions that um, we're working on solving. Um, the first one is what we're working on, and this is something we're already doing in-house and we've got good strategies on how to do this, is to build an accurate biomechanical model that goes from intact limb measurements. So for example, the um, if it's a unilateral amputation on, on a canine or or a human, we could measure like, you know, the other the index finger on the other side or like um, the other uh, leg or um, the same on a dog, like the circumference of their limb, the limb segment lengths. And then we, from that, we compute what the, what the paw strength or like the output torque should be and what the, um, uh, what the, uh, the range of motion should be. And then we take that uh, information and then uh, determine how thick the ligaments should be on the bone and like what should the moment arm, like what's the length of the moment arm on the, um, the prosthesis itself so that um, we can adapt this type of 3D printed model 
to any type of amputation for um, residual limbs. So that's one of the things that we're working on now. But an even bigger question, and this is where um, the expertise of a lot of you guys might come in too, is that um, how do we mitigate infection? Because you have a tendon that's traveling inside and outside of the body. And we've got some ideas on how we can do this, maybe through like encapsulating the tendon entirely. Like for example, run an IV tube that runs from the inside of the skin, goes all the way around the prosthesis and goes back inside the skin as well. Um, but there's like limitations on that. For example, if that breaks, then what do you do? Do you have to have another surgery, et cetera? So we haven't quite figured out like, like a good strategy for doing the infection mitigation. Uh, and um, especially on the clinical side, this is, um, I, I would love to hear uh, opinions or, or ideas that you guys might have on how we can keep uh, a prosthesis like this um, from infecting and uh, the, the body because of the tendon that travels back and forth. Um, and so, with that, a lot of the videos that you saw were part of Legendary Pictures documentary that was done on us called Make It Work. Um, the launch, you, it's available to watch for free on Amazon and Roku. Um, it's episode four. Um, and if you wanna contact me to follow up or if you have any questions on this, obviously I'll, I'll be uh, continuing on right now uh, to answer any questions uh, live. But if you wanna follow up with me, if you wanna come visit the lab, uh, it's basically like a robotics playground. We have all the equipment to build any robot you could imagine here. Um, it's a, an awesome place to come uh, visit and get inspired. So um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Um, and thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Okay, Adil, <clears throat> absolutely amazing. I mean, just all scale inspiring. And uh, I think what you guys have been able to accomplish over a period of time has literally changed the game in terms of how we can imagine what might be possible for uh, people with limb differences. Every time I see you talk, it's like, it doesn't just go like this. You got these like step functions, okay, <laughs> that you keep jumping. And uh, even the latest stuff is just, it's really head spinning. And uh, honestly, I just can't imagine a more inspiring uh, member of our community to kind of help us all dream about what we might accomplish when we're at this nexus of interface in, of engineering and medicine and really have no boundaries except our own imagination, right? It's a really extraordinary place for us to be in. Okay, I think you just kind of embody what's possible in that context. I'd love to open it up uh, to questions. And uh, I think we've got a couple already from the chat. Uh, there's one uh, from CBJ, who I'm so sorry, I, I don't I haven't yet been able to guess who CBJ is. So if you could, uh, if CBJ could please stand up and go ahead and ask your question, that'd be great. Hey, Adil, it's Cliff Johnson. Hey. <laughs> I saw in your video from Ecuador, it looked like you had Juan using mirror therapy to activate the appropriate muscles in his forearm. Do you still use that today when you're training the people to use the ability hand? And so uh, that's a phenomenal question. And a lot of that will depend on the, um, the occupational therapists and the, the physical therapists that the patients are working with afterwards. Now, that being said, we have staff uh, on board to work with those um, OTs and PTs. And if that's something that's, um, that's deemed necessary, then yeah, absolutely. We would do, um, uh, do mirror therapy um, if that's something that would be helpful for those patients. Um, a lot of our recent patients, we've had some that like, you know, are, are congenital um, amputees. So mirror therapy for them might not work as well because they don't have necessarily the brain structures that correspond to those particular areas. Um, and so for them, it's more a case of like uh, building up the muscle that is within um, their, their residual limb and then um, once those muscles get stronger, then you can really get good signals coming from, uh, uh, from your EMG. It's usually the traumatic patients that respond uh, a lot better to the, the mirror therapy, but um, it, when, when it works, it works really well. That's awesome, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, K-H-E-L-D. And K-H-E-L-D, you might be on mute. Oh, hey, sorry. This is uh, Kendall Held. Um, myoelectric pickups, are you, for the forearm, like in some of the more crude prostheses that I've seen, it's just like a flexor and an extensor one. But it looks like you're using several, like on several different muscles, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, to be 100% to be upfront, right? So the, the ability hand that they've got over here. Um, so I'll... I'm going to pop this hand off. So 
what we make in particular is the hand and the electronics that that um, power the hand. So the, the charging unit, the batteries that are inside, and then the, the hand itself. We're actually agnostic to the control system. We don't necessarily care how you control it, as long as you just give it like the, the right either analog signals that open and close it or digital signals that tell you exactly which finger or what grip um, to move. So our, our, uh, our hand works with um, the, the two channel, the rudimentary myoelectric control, where it's just those two channels. It works with uh, pattern recognition systems where you have eight electrodes going around in a machine learning algorithm. Um, it works with like a linear transducer where it's like a harness attached to your shoulder and then you move a cable uh, to open and close the hand. Um, most recently, we, um, uh, we were working with uh, UPIT when they were doing um, uh, spinal cord implants and uh, cortical implants um, to control um, the, the movement of the hand as well. And it's all just sending the, the right signal to our hand. So we're agnostic to the control system in particular. Um, that being said, we are working on a, uh, on a newer type of um, sensor that's, e uh, that's potentially even more sensitive than, um, than EMG to measure like the, the change in, in um, muscle movements on your skin and it's using uh, infrared sensors. And we've got a project coming up where we're trying to enable um, a local patient um, who got a specific surgery where they rerouted his nerves and his residual limb that gives him like individual finger control. And with the sensors that we're developing uh, based on infrared, um, we're hoping that we would actually uh, able to give him um, uh, like this individual finger control that's position based and that's very natural. So that's going to be uh, one of the mo uh, more exciting things that's coming up soon that I didn't even talk about in this uh, presentation. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Sammy Frakes has a practical question, but also want to give her the opportunity if there's anything else, Sammy, that you wanted to ask uh, Adil, I'm sure he'd be happy to go after it. Hi, yeah, I was just asking if like this was going to be recorded because my um, I'm actually in a group for a senior design like at U of I and we're making a soft robotics prosthetic hand. So this was like super cool to see like you doing like a more like an actual practical version of what we're trying to just do in a lab. So this was super cool to see. But yeah, I was just wondering um, if this was going to be posted so that my group mates could see it because um, just yeah, like I said, just seeing this in like an actual industry setting was just really applicable and so neat to our project. And Sammy, what, uh, which, uh, what senior design, like, is it bio-e, is it like ECE? Yeah, it's bioengineering. So it's like wow. 435, 436 with um, Dr. Holly Galecki. So nice. nice. Yeah, really fun. And, and Sammy, if, if you guys want to come visit the lab too, we can make that happen. I mean, we got to follow like COVID protocols and everything, but um, yeah, we can definitely make that happen if that's something you're interested in. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. I'll definitely um, reach out to you. Okay, awesome. Okay, so Adil, I gotta warn you in all the right ways that the next question is a loaded question because Jessica Breitbart is our fundraiser extraordinaire. So uh, Jessica, with that intro, could you please ask your question? So Adil, last time we talked, you were looking for funding and I know for our students it's really interesting. They're really interested in knowing how you can launch a company. So, um, were you able to get that funding? Where are you at? Has the grant funding helped you to get to this next level of design? And um, what's next for you? Sure. So um, the answers to those questions are yes. So um, we uh, we uh, got a phase two um, SBAR grant uh, award from the NSF last year. So that was immensely helpful um, to us. And so that was for like, I think 750,000 from NSF. And we just applied for another phase two from NSF um, for a, an additional million um, that hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll hear back from in the next uh, couple of months, um, whether we got that one. That's for the sensory feedback stuff. Um, but uh, we, uh, we were able to make our goal in uh, raising angel investor funding as well. And uh, primarily, um, that was from uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of clinicians actually here from um, the, uh, from Carl, from Christie Clinic, uh, from Chicago, like some surgeons up there, um, along with um, Illinois Ventures is one of our, um, our, our uh, VCs who's involved, Irish Angels, and 8VC uh, based on the Bay Area. So um, yes, we, we were able to actually secure funding, uh, the funding that we needed for this stuff. Um, interestingly, one of the things that we want to do um, is that we, so I had mentioned we had been able to increase access to these prosthetic limbs from like 10% of the population to like 75% by getting it covered under Medicare. 
Um, however, there's still 25% of the upper limb uh, difference population that's either on Medicaid or uninsured, or, uh, you know, sometimes their insurance will reject it, like anyway, like Blue Cross and Blue Shield sometimes rejects, right? Uh, and for them, there's, uh, they, they get stuck with like a hook, essentially, right? And one of the things we want to do is we want to start a nonprofit subsidiary of the company that accepts donations to help subsidize the cost for those who, uh, whose insurance can't, um, can't pay for this prosthetic hand. And so um, that's something that we're going to be working on over the next uh, couple of months and like um, partnering with other organizations too to help fundraise to get these prosthetic hands to people who can't afford them both in the US and eventually uh, abroad as well. So um, there'll be a, a massive fundraising effort uh, on our front um, for that too that um, I'll, I'll probably want to pick your brain about too about how to uh, do some of those things as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to help you on that end and I'm glad to hear that the funding has come through. I think you know, are, is your goal to stay privately funded and, and a closely held company? Or are you looking to license your technology or are you hoping to uh, be bought out? So, I mean, we're, we're open to all of those things, um, to, to be completely honest. Right now, I, I mean, we, we're just, we are developing so much like uh, amazing technology with all the incredible engineers, uh, many of whom are actually from U of I um, as well from the engineering departments here. And, um, and, and so we can see some of that technology, especially like the sensory feedback technology being licensed out to like VR um, spaces, for example. Um, but for, for now, our plan is to just like focus like and, and get uh, this, this hand out the door. We're preparing for a nationwide launch of the Ability Hand um, soon um, this year. So um, that's like uh, where mo the majority of our time is being spent right now. Um, and, uh, and eventually we'll see, we'll see where this goes over the next couple of years. It's been an incredible and, um, uh, and fulfilling journey for sure uh, over the last six years. It's been fun to watch your progress and yeah, definitely reach out. Building on a, a similar theme, uh, Dan had some questions about commercialization as well, Adil. Hi, Adil. Uh, this is Dan Rodewig. I work with Jessica. And I just was curious about the commercial. You kind of already started to hint on that, but I wanted to hear about the commercialization plans. And then also specifically, what kind of benefit would that have to Champaign-Urbana? Would you stay local with production? That kind of thing. Just curious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the way that our model works is that I, I can't go into the specifics on the pricing um, in particular, and a lot of that depends on in insurance as well. Um, but we sell our hand to the clinicians. The clinicians are, are known as prosthetists. Um, and so they went through like two years of uh, prosthetics training, usually a master's program, where they learn how to mold sockets um, that fit the residual limbs of the users and then attach the terminal end device like an ability hand um, to that socket. And so we sell it to them and then they will prepare the reimbursement uh, package to the insurance company and then the insurance will get back and then, um, and then pay them and then they'll pay us um, for however much they bought our, uh, our hand for. Um, and then the user will just pay whatever their copay is. So um, the prosthetists usually double their margins and Medicare, uh, like we're, again, we're priced at a uh, price point that Medicare will cover. So uh, Medicare likes to pay for um, like our hand over others because um, it, it, it's uh, priced less. And then the patient again, just pays their copay. So it's like a win-win, win-win for everyone in the value chain uh, in particular. And one of the reasons why we're able to keep our costs so low is particularly because we're doing uh, the manufacturing here in Champaign. Um, and uh, the engineering talent pool here at, at U of I is just so good that um, one of the things that I would like to do is even if the company moves that I would like to keep production um, of like uh, uh, the ability hand here in Champaign. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where my headspace is at right now. But again, I mean, we didn't know that a pandemic was coming either. So I, I can't say for certain on, on, on any of this stuff, um, like where we might be like in, in like a, a couple of years. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Those, those are all, any other questions from the chat before I ask uh, one of my own? Does anyone else want to want to jump in, even if you haven't put it in the chat? Uh, we got no holds barred situation here, so just go for it. <laughs> I did see one that says, "Can you drive with it?" But we did show a video. Oh, yeah, sorry, I skipped that one because I thought you covered that one. Uh, <laughs> yes. 
uh, Bill, in case you didn't see it, uh, the answer was a resounding yes. <laughs> I thought that was the, the, the part of that video that you didn't mention, uh, Adil, was that you had the courage to get in the car with the person who was uh, driving with the first time. So I guess you can put your, put your own health <laughs> or your mouth in. Uh, so, so, Adil, there's this, uh, this amazing phenomenon where if you hyper-utilize certain parts of your physiology, you'll get reorganization of your homunculus to disproportionately kind of compensate for that utilization. Michael Jordan shooting, you know, shots or the violinist, et cetera. There's all this great uh, neuroscience around this. Have you yet looked at or do you have a hypothesis around whether or not you could actually get homunculus reorganization and or proportionation of brain matter dedicated once someone's using these in a longitudinal fashion? Yeah, and, and so um, there's studies that we haven't done, but others have done that have shown um, a plastic reorganization in those areas um, of, the, uh, of the motor cortex in particular when you use a prosthesis over um, a long period of time. Um, by and large, though, like when you have the amputation, those portions like just atrophy um, in, in the motor cortex, and then um, they get rewired from other neurons in, 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 in other areas. Uh, sensory feedback is a bit of an interesting one, though, because there was a study that was like recently published, like literally like three months ago um, from uh, Sleeman Bensmaya's group uh, over at University of Chicago and uh, Max Ortiz Catalan's group uh, over in um, Sweden. And they showed that um, by providing sensory feedback in areas that are not um, exactly specific to the, the, um, the place that you're touching, that reorganization does not actually happen um, in the brain. And so it's, uh, it's even more important um, to get physiologically accurate um, like sensations that are corresponding to the anatomical location that was, uh, that was amputated. And the, uh, on, on one hand, uh, on one hand, um, the, <laughs> the, um, the pressure sensors that we have um, in, the, in the fingertips that are uh, in here, we, just, we can just dump that, that information out, right? So it, it, we're agnostic to the actuation mechanism of the sensory feedback that we're giving to the user as well. We don't care if it's a vibration motor that like we have, we don't care if it's electrotactile stimulation or a spinal cord implant or a peripheral nerve cuff or a um, sensory cortex uh, implanted as well. This can work with all of those systems. It just is that the more invasive you go and the more direct you might go to that 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 region so like maybe the, the s1 in your brain um the more like the more useful it might become to the user itself but you also run the risk of you know you have to do a surgery to get an implant in your brain right but i mean hey there's Neuralink coming out right so we, we partner with elon and then and then hey we can have our, our my, literal mind controlled and mind feeling prosthetic limbs with, with him, right? <laughs> you, just jumped, you just jumped to my next question. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, in all seriousness, like this is really exciting technology. Is that where you're headed next? I mean, can Neuralink coupled to the prosthesis be the future here? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we're looking at in the next five years too. We want to go invasive um, with a lot of this technology, right? And so even the, the artificial tendon thing that I was mentioning, right? What that, what that uh, solves for is, A, it solves for the the next joint, the next uh, like like distal joint prior or, or, or distal to the amputation, and can you can get like that muscle movement back from your from your residual tendons, um, and you get that proprioception back. But what you don't have is the the more distal um, amputated uh, parts of your of your body um, or the sensation like the touch feedback. So for that, we would still have to use like electrical means and, and like invasive stimulation means in order to uh, make those things happen. So yeah, definitely, I think where the future is heading and where we want to go with this stuff is as implanted electrodes is like these, um, these invasive human machine interfaces that we want to develop. Um, and um, yeah, and, and we've started by building the tools that you can use um, to interface with those devices. And the next step will be to actually do the, the body interface itself. Awesome. Oh, it's, it's super exciting. Uh, all right. So uh, a physician innovator at Carl, Dr. Mike Chapersky has a question to you about uh, FDA. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I guess, it's, do we have FDA approval for it? So um, this is technically a class one exempt um, device. So we register. So all we had to do is register with the FDA. Um, but yes, it is an FDA registered medical device. Um, so if you go on FDA's website, you can find our listing there. Um, and we had to get it. Uh, uh, we had to get it registered with the FDA if we wanted to 
um, have it covered by insurance. So that was a, a huge milestone um, for us um, to do as well. And following up with you, can you talk a little bit about that process? So anybody thinking about developing a device, what does it take to get this to be certified with the FDA? Yeah, so um, there were there were a couple of concessions that we had to make, um, and they were uh, so they were kind of like business decisions. And and one of the things so I've, I've been talking about um, that uh, our, our hand is agnostic to the control system, and one of the reasons why we did that too is because if we developed our own um, electrodes, which we have done in the past, um, these are technically FDA Class II devices, and um, there's uh, we can go through a process called a a five ten K. Um, to um, to get these approved through the FDA, which takes about like you know six to eight months to get, um, and especially if there are predicate devices on the market already that are doing similar things, which for muscle sensors there already are. Um, but you know it can be like eighteen to twenty thousand dollars to go through the entire process. And you know like two years ago when we were first like going through like and trying to commercialize this stuff, we didn't have that kind of money to like spend. So what we did is that instead of selling the electrodes, we said that we'll be agnostic to the control system, right? And that worked in our favor too, because every, like there were a lot of other companies who were developing their own control systems that were getting the FDA approval. So we're like, okay, we'll just make sure that we're compatible with their systems. And they already went through the FDA approval process. And that way the clinician can then decide what is the best control system to use for their patient. So they're not relegated to whatever we give them um, in, in the box as well. That being said, um, for the electrical stimulation stuff, when that um, when that research like finally gets to a point where we're or we have like a commercialized product that is a class two device, the predicate for it would be a tens unit that you can get at Walgreens for like fifty bucks. Um, it's using the same system. It's the algorithms in it that are like uh, different that allow us to make it feel like the the different sensations. And for that, yes, we will be going through the six to eight month five ten k process. But again, it's fairly straightforward. It's not a, a huge barrier. When we get into some of the more invasive implanted stuff, um, that will be new territory for us um, and probably somewhere along like a, a class two non 510K or a class three um, surgery as well. Um, but I think the benefits are worth it to figure it out because that technology could really be revolutionary to um, the, the patients that we'd be benefit or that would be benefiting. Awesome, okay. Uh, Bill Oliveira has some comments about uh, how to think about the infection issue and I think, uh, Adil, you provided us so much inspiration. I think it'd be great if anyone on the call has thoughts to give back to Adil about how we might think about that in infection issue or advice or guidance, that'd be great. So, uh, Bill, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when you have something outside the body, uh, infection is always gonna be difficult to, to, to control, especially in the long run. <clears throat> there are certain types of plastic-like devices that can be impregnated with antibiotics. And, you know, obviously that would uh, help somewhat, but, uh, you know, even that uh, in the long run, it's, it, it's difficult to, you know, overcome uh, anything that exits the body, uh, you know, in a long-term basis uh, to prevent infection from ultimately setting in. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and yeah, and, and like I said, we've got we've got a couple ideas. And 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 Bill, if it's okay, I'd love to um, follow up with you um, uh, about some of those ideas too. If if that would be uh, if you'd be open to that. Yeah, sure. Be happy to talk with you. I can stop by your lab. I'd love love to see the lab out there. <laughs> Absolutely, we would love to have you here too. Yeah, I'll I'll. I'll is, do you have your is your email on the uh, on the on the uh, on the here, I, I, um, I can type it in the chat. Um, okay, so, sure. Um, so you guys can email me. Awesome. All Great. right. Do you have any other infectious disease fellows, physicians, or physicians in training who kind of want to weigh in? It's a really interesting question, right? There's a, there's a risk-benefit analysis that has to be done, right, in, deal, in dealing with the infection risk coupled to the functional gain. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a great forum to have the conversation. Anyone else want to weigh in on thoughts of uh, ideas, challenges, issues? What is the deal obviously not thought of that he really needs to be thinking about? This is Kendall Held again. I'm a uh, physical medicine rehabilitation physician. Um, from my, I have, don't have firsthand experience with the uh, Oh, now that I'm on the spot, the, uh, the stuff they're doing in Australia. Um, 
with the bolts into like the femur or into the leg. Mm -hmm. The uh, anyway, but I know that, um, or from my understanding, the infection rate really isn't all that bad with those. And once they get them put in, they work really well. Yeah, and, and for them, they just need to uh, literally just wash it with soap and water um, twice a day. And the less you mess with it, the less it gets infected. So if you're if you're picking at it all the time, then that's what usually causes um, the infection to, to happen there. And you know, I, I've been trying to find in particular like reasons why it doesn't get infected. And I even in the research papers, they don't really give that many like clues. Um, as to why, and, and, and I've even asked like the Australian people, we've, we've got some connections there because like I had mentioned, there is a, um, there's an above knee uh, patient who's uh, local to the area here, who's visited our lab a couple of times and, and has brought some of the, uh, the uh, engineers who worked on the device from Australia to our lab as well. And um, I think they don't quite know themselves <laughs> either why um, it, it, uh, it's so effective uh, in the way it is, or they're, it's still like nascent and they're not quite 100% uh, positive. I mean, one of the things it's made out of titanium and so titanium is a lot more inert and, and as maybe some antibacterial properties in and of itself that um, help um, reduce the amount of infection. That's one of the things that they said in like one of their, their papers, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, one advantage that the, the osteointegration abutment has over something like ours though is that it's static. It does not move. Um, so the problem with like the tendons in particular is that it's going outside of the body and then moving back in with an excursion of about like a centimeter. So that's, that's one of the particularly challenging uh, parts. And like some of the things that we've been considering is like creating like a, a demilitarized zone, if you will. And so that's like, like a, where the, the movement between the skin and the, or between the inside of the body and the outside body happens. And if we can like have something inside of there that like, you know, brushes off materials or disinfects like the, the tendon as it goes back in or something like that. That's some of the things that we've been talking about. I know one of the, the ideas that I'd mentioned earlier was encapsulating the entire tendon around its length as it goes outside the body and back in and like loops around um, the prosthesis. But the problem with that is that the prosthesis will likely eventually get damaged on the, uh, like, uh, on, uh, on the prosthesis side itself. If it gets damaged there, then what do you do? Do you have to like take that out and then do another surgery to like insert it back in, which would just be um, a, a huge problem. So, um, and I say Mark Johnson was saying, yeah, um, the, the PA catheters in the ICU. So yeah, we were we literally were looking are, are looking at doing IV tubing that goes around the entire uh, length of the the tendon, and the IV tubing would be static, and then the the um, the uh, what do you call it? The, the tendon itself would move inside of the IV tubing. Um, and so it would be completely sterile inside the IV tubing. But again, there's like practical issues like IV tubing kinks and like, um, and again, if it breaks distal to the uh, side of the amputation, then how do you like reinsert it? How do you fix that without like introducing bacteria into the body? So Mark, while we've got you on the spot, uh, any other thoughts? I mean, obviously it's a great connection point. The catheters, right? Is they, they, in a sense, spend time in and out, and there is an interface there, right? So what have we learned uh, in the kind of clinical use of catheters and when they do and don't get affected that might be helpful to a deal? Yeah, we've learned pretty much just to get them out whenever we can and use them as little as possible. Okay. <laughs> That's a uh, thing we've learned, number one. Number two is that it's, it's okay for it to come out, but going back in is more of a problem. Like if you need to advance a catheter, that's a problem. Places where you adjust would be like the, um, the swan Gans catheter or maybe the uh, TVP, the transvenous pacer that you can slide in and out. But it's got this um, sheath around, like, kind of like Adil was talking about with uh, the IV tubing. For this case, it's not IV tubing. It's more of like a, just a plastic sheath. So these are, these are good questions. The other is, you know, you think about ports. So a lot of things are implanted. Um, so if you have something that's implanted, and then not, I don't know how you could, how you could do that. That's more for, you know, ports are pretty good. They just do a, a needle connection there. Um, Bill Olivero, you know, our answer for when we're putting something in the brain is that they just have to stay in the ICU the whole time. So that's a problem um, when they have like an external um, ventricular uh, catheter. Um, but eventually they move to more of an implanted scenario. So I, I don't have a whole lot more to add. You're, you seem way ahead of me, especially um, 
reading the literature, but I'd be happy to talk more. The other uh, connection point, so thanks, Mark. I was thinking a deal about cardiac pacemaker technology. There's, there's going to be a ton of learnings in that space that may or may not be helpful. But then again, as you point out, you don't usually tend to pull your cardiac pacemaker in and out, right? It's, uh, it's more of a fixed outcome. So uh, the other last question I had for you, deal. so you, you hinted at this at one point in your talk, uh, the concept of superhumanity. Mm -hmm. So we talk about restoring function, but clearly your mind must be racing about, you know, going beyond. And of, of course, those with limb differences should get that superhuman strength first. I love the idea of, uh, you know, there's no reason to stop, right? Absolutely. I mean, one of our taglines is like, why be human when you can be more, right? <laughs> so I, honestly, I'd love to hear you just kind of like let your mind race on that a little bit. Like, what are you dreaming about there? So what are potentially some superhuman capabilities that might actually be quite practical and useful, whether it's for people with limb differences, soldiers, surgeons, mom's taking care of, father's taking care of a kid, anybody, right? Like who, who, who could use some extra help? And uh, have you guys thought about going beyond, you know, physiology? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of been, uh, there's been a lot of work in like exoskeleton literature, um, uh, specifically addressing some of these things too, right? Um, exoskeletons that are developed for like, you know, firefighters and like, so that they can carry heavy loads much more easily or, or like run faster, uh, like out, out of like a fire or something like that, right? Um, so those are definite capabilities that like, you know, if we like, increase the strength of our motors, we can make them stronger than like human grip forces, for example, right? Um, uh, or like we can like increase the speed of our motors and make them even faster than like a, a finger might be able to respond or have like reflexes that we've built into them that correspond to like certain situations um, in particular. You know, it's interesting, like one of the, um, one of the projects that we did while I was a, a grad student in Professor Brettel's lab um, was we had put a camera in the hand um, and the, the reason for putting the camera in the hand initially was that um, so that if you you can recognize the shape of an object as you're approaching it and then the hand automatically predicts the uh, appropriate the grip to grip that with so um, you don't have to like then switch or do something weird to make a different grip you just close your hand and it would uh, do the right one uh, appropriately but I mean if you have a camera in your hand there's like a bunch of different things you can do there, right? Like, I mean, you pair that up with like, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, your phone. You can do like a augmented reality type stuff, like with the with like a camera there. There's, yeah, there's like a ton of possibilities <laughs> that we can do, and I think we're just like scratching the surface of that. With especially with the boom in VR and AR um, recently, um, the fact that this is kind of like um, an Internet of Things uh, type device too that we can hook it up to the cloud. And like, uh, I guess we can like integrate Alexa, for example, and uh, hopefully I didn't trigger anyone's um, uh, Amazon Echo by saying that, sorry. Um, but, uh, but like giving voice commands to your, your hand to like do certain, certain things, right? Having LCD screens that are built in um, that are controlled from your nervous system, right? Again, like things that we can't do now, but there's no reason why we can't do that w within the next like five to 10 years. Uh, I think a follow up, uh, uh, Dean Lee, did you have a follow up question? Yeah, I, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is robotic surgery, right? Sure. So currently, the robotic surgery is very clunky. You don't actually use intuitive, right, command using your muscles. You have to relearn the skill sets to control the Da Vinci and other stuff, right? Imagine you can just use your hands and control mini hands inside the body to do robotic surgery, right? The mini Absolutely. hands can be as small as anything, right? You, you can use your regular movement to actually control uh, whatever is inside the body to do the surgery. That is a lot, right? A lot more efficient than what we're doing with the clunky devices that we're using. It is not intuitive. It doesn't come from our natural abilities. Yeah, and that is definitely one of the, the areas that we're looking into with the sensory feedback technology too, is that if you're operating like a, a Da Vinci, right? Um, right? Then how do you give the haptic feedback when the when the uh, end effect or when the, when the needle's like about to puncture the, the skin, right? right? Um, like how do you know how deep you're going? How do you have that proprioceptive feedback? Those don't, I'm assuming those don't exist really well. They don't exist now. They use yeah. your, your visuals, right? Exactly. You can add proprioceptions, the visual, and the natural control 
to the whole process that you will revolutionize robotic surgery overnight because the, the robots are not robots. They're <laughs> sensory, right? Mechanical devices you control using very unnatural, right? Trained skills. Mm -hmm. But if you actually make it into very natural uh, uh, manual skills that you have developed as a surgeon and control the stuff using, in addition to visual proprioception, you win the battle overnight. And that's a huge market, much bigger market than the limb, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. But just a thought when I was looking at your progression, I said, hey, that's a, another big step function, right? <laughs> to get into a market that you're not in, but it's a bigger market and the potential return is huge. And you have some uh, initial uh, technology that can be applied almost immediately. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? We're almost uh, out of time. Okay, it's been a fantastic discussion, a deal. I, I think uh, to say that you're an inspiring member of our community is the biggest understatement I could make. You and your team have done just something extraordinary. And I think as we, we dream about physician innovators in the making, uh, I think you're quite a role model, okay, for what we're hoping uh, Carl Illinois College of Medicine uh, enables and empowers on a regular basis. So thank you for being uh, kind of such an inspiration to all of us and wish you and your team just tremendous continued success, okay, as you continue to aim for your goals. Thanks, Marty, and thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.